You are listening to Dove Valley Deep Divers with Eric Trickle and Lance Sanderson. Ball comes out of the hands of Newton. It's on the ground, picked up by T.J. Ward at the four-yard line. Vaughn Miller did it again. On Overtime Media. Okay, we're live. You all know the drill. We got to let the stream breathe just for a few seconds. Make sure we're nice and stable for your listening and viewing pleasure. Welcome in, everybody. This is not the Huddle Up podcast. As you know, it's Friday, 6 o'clock Mountain. That means it is time for the Dove Valley Deep Divers. I'm your fill-in host for tonight, Chad Jensen. And with me tonight, you know him as one of the regular co-hosts of the DVDD podcast, senior draft analyst at milehighhuddle.com, Eric Trickle. Eric, I want to get your thoughts on Jeff Hireman and all that, but before we do, Lance, who, whose crazy idea was it to make Lance Sanderson a dad? <laughs> all joking aside, all joking aside, we love him and uh, congrats to to Lance and and his uh, his his uh, misses and his new baby son, Caven. Caven Sanderson yeah. enters this world. So what uh, what great times we live in. Yeah, definitely. Super excited for him. I mean, just doing the podcast with him and seeing him talk about it. I mean, the few times we got questions about it on here and everything, like he was super excited. I'm super excited for him and uh, just hope he's ready for fatherhood because sometimes it can be a little frustrating, but uh, it's there's nothing better in it in the world. I don't think anyone is truly ready until it just happens. And, you know, I think dads and mothers alike, I think everyone can kind of relate to this. You think, you know, when you're before you become a parent, you think, you know what it's going to be like. But in reality, you have no idea. And I mean that in the best (laughs) and sometimes the worst sense. But I'll say this about fatherhood, parenthood, is that it adds a depth of enjoyment, a depth of joy, a depth of just positive stuff to your life that you just didn't know existed until you become a parent. Yeah. And uh, I remember when Chelsea first told me she was pregnant with Rosie. I mean, I didn't want kids originally uh, just for a lot of reasons, not going to get into it, but uh, the moment she told me like it all changed. And then after going through everything, like just how much that I've grown uh, from what I can tell as a person or anything, like just, having a kid is really can be the best thing that happens to you. And so again, Lance, if you're watching, I mean, I'm not sure if you are, I doubt you are, but man, congratulations again, super excited for you and uh, can't wait for you to get up here so I can see him in person. Amen. Amen. Congrats to the Sanderson clan. And we don't normally give off, um, you know, there's no maternity time here at, MHH, I guess in this case, Eric, it would be paternity time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But in all seriousness, again, congratulations to Lance. It's a once in a lifetime era. I told him, take, he's like, you know, we were talking just very briefly about the the day his son was born. And I, I had a friend when my first child was born that told me, whatever you do, once the dust settles a little bit, sit down and write down like a journal entry type. I'm not a journal keeper. But he said, I'm telling you right now, in the moment, you'll think this is unbelievable. This is something I'll never forget. And in in, in many ways, you you never will forget it, of course. But (laughs) so much of the detail, I'm telling you, now many years down the road, more than a decade down the road, almost two, you do forget a lot of the things that you didn't think you would ever forget. It just memory dims and fades. And so I told him, man, write it all down, write down your thoughts, how you felt and just stuff like that. And uh, anyway, fatherhood is a joy, Eric. It is. It is. But today, we're not here to talk about fatherhood as much as we love and celebrate (laughs) Zach, uh, uh, Zach, Lance becoming a a father in uh, today's today's topsy-turvy world. What we are here to talk to you about is your Denver Broncos, and we're going to get to that here in just a second. Really quickly, we want to make sure you know how to connect with the Dove Valley Deep Divers on social media. Mile High Huddle continues to grow, which means all the associated podcasts continue to grow. It's important to know how to connect. Make sure you follow Dove Valley Deep Divers on Twitter at DVDD underscore pod, at DVDD underscore pod. And then also here, 
you want to follow Eric Trickle at Eric Trickle. That's Eric with a CK at Eric Trickle. And you can find me at Chad and Jensen. And then gang, if you're in a position, we want to gently draw your attention to our merch store. It's the URL is huddleuppod.com. Get your swag on, get yourself either a Dove Valley deep divers hat, which conspicuously. Oh, all right. I was going to say Eric's not repping his own <laughs> brand, but he is, he's got the shirt on Get yourself a DVDD hat shirt. There's mile high huddle swag. There's hoodies, there's mugs, there's face masks, a little something for everybody. It's a great way to support what we do here at MHH. And if you're not in a position to do that, it's all good. No matter where you are listening, whether you're live with us now or you're listening to this after the fact on demand as a podcast, these three things each and every one of you can do to help support what we're doing. Number one, subscribe. That's especially key on all podcast platforms. Subscribe and YouTube especially. Like this video, like this episode, And if you really love what we're doing for you on the daily, bringing you seven podcasts per week, hanging out with you live for an hour and change each and every night to break down the latest Broncos news, share it out there. Share these videos out there. Help us grow, continue to grow, and reach like-minded Broncos fans just like you. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, Eric. Jeff Hireman, look, this was no surprise to any of us in the know. I mean, we could all see this coming from – million miles down the road as soon as the Nick Vanette deal was made. I mean, we were already in, I would say between December, uh, let's see, December 30th, which was the final regular season game. And whenever that was in March that uh, Vanette was signed, we had already been talking about Jeff Hireman as a likely camp casualty type because of his relative lack of impact because of the log jam at tight end. And, once Nick Vanette was signed, it became a fate accompli. I'm surprised it took this long. Nevertheless, it happened. What was your gut reaction? The Broncos released Jeff Hireman. It was a thing of kind of, for lack of a better way to put it, I guess kind of like relief. Not so much for me, but for him. Because I'm sure he had to see the writing on the wall come in. Um, I'm sure he had heard the rumors about them trying to trade him during the draft. I'm sure that they've heard the talks and obviously saw everything about when they signed Nick Bennett. It, it's hard to miss all these signs that the Broncos gave that Jeff Hireman might not have that that best of chance. So now he's getting out, and despite everything that's going on, he has at least a chance to go catch on with another team that could be looking for a veteran presence at tight end. So feeling a little bit of relief for him because now he, it's a better chance. With no preseason games, I mean – I've seen this a lot about, and it was kind of what you said about them keeping him this long. And I think that part of it was, I mean, they wanted to trade him during the draft. No, there was interest, but not enough to actually get something done. I think that they're just kind of holding that hope that if they had a preseason, he'd be able to go out there and build up his value enough to finally get a trade done. And I think that with no preseason games now, that it just became time to cut bait and and basically run. So just it's just kind of all that. And now I'm excited to see these reps that and practices go to guys like Austin Fort after what he showed last year, Jake, Butt, who's supposedly finally healthy and ready to go and just Albert Okaway, and all these guys. I'm, ex- I'm excited for them as well. Getting some of these reps that Jeff Hardman would have been taken up. This is a good joke from regular <laughs> listener and big time member of the MHH community, especially on, on social media, on YouTube, Kenneth Booker. He says, Jeff Hireman came in and applied at my job today. We told him we don't hire people who disappear 80% of the time. (laughs) Take that resume on down the road is what Booker's saying. You know, (laughs) as you said, uh, Eric, as you said here, um, you know, he's going to try and land on his feet. He's still in the prime of his NFL career in terms of age and years. I wouldn't be surprised if the Minnesota Vikings try and find a little place on the roster for him, maybe. I mean, it's a pretty obvious choice because Gary Kubiak was the head coach in Denver that drafted Hireman. I don't know exactly how much Kubiak had a, how much of a role Kubiak had in the yeah. scouting and slash drafting of Hireman. But I know as when the, you know, when the 2015 draft rolled around, we were all surprised. You know, I lean on Eric tremendously during pre-draft and draft time for information and insight on, on prospects. I was surprised. Eric was surprised. Like I barely even knew who Jeff Hireman was. Third round pick, Broncos select, Jeff Hireman, tight end, Ohio State. We're like, what? Not that it was a 
bad pick. It was just an early pick. I don't think, yeah. if I remember right, Eric, you you viewed him as like a fifth round caliber guy. Like late fourth, early fifth or something like that. I can't remember okay. exactly, but yeah. So it was definitely never, a little bit early. I, do you think, how much do you think, <laughs> I don't know if you've heard from the people you've talked to and your, your, your sources out there in the NFL landscape, but how much do you think Gary Kubiak played a role in that pick? I think he actually played quite a bit of a role. Um, I don't know for sure exactly how much, but I know, I mean, it's been kind of well known that Gary Kubiak had a, a pretty big hand in how they drafted those couple of years that he was here with the Broncos. And even that 2017 draft, I mean, that was the year after he stepped down, but he did a lot during that. And he still, right. he was still in Elway's ear about it. I mean, that's a big reason why Garrett Bowles is in Denver. Um, so there's a lot there that with it. And I think that he did have a big part of it. And then I, if I remember correctly, I think the Minnesota Vikings actually could use another tight end. I'm not a hundred percent sure how their tight end room looks after Kyle Rudolph, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised either to see the Chicago bears go get him because apparently they're going to go with 10 tight ends and a quarterback. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> we have a very generous super chat. Zeus McPeak jumping in from our MHH Mount Rushmore, longtime listener of all the podcasts and just huge member of our community. Stu, that's a very generous super chat. We thank you. As you know, my friend, thank it you. means a lot to us. And his his message here is, and I'm sure Lance will be listening to this. If he's not with us live, he'll be listening after the fact. But Stu's message is, congrats, Lance. Enjoy this precious time. And it really is precious. I saw a picture Lance shared on social media of his baby boy in a Broncos jersey already, indoctrinating him young, indoctrinating him early. But uh, really appreciate that, Stu. Your generosity is is just phenomenal, and it means a lot to all of us. Yeah, I got. I may have to keep him, uh, keep Lance away and Caven away from Rosie. There, I mean, don't want anything happening there. I like Lance, <laughs> but family. Eh. There you go. Uh, we also got Terry jumping in. North of the 49th parallel <laughs> up in Canada, proving that Broncos country is not a geographic location. You guys know this. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is a state of being. He says, too gosh dat gum warm for a tie today. I forgive you, Eric. You're slipping. <laughs> still- They're catching you slipping here, Eric. Where's that tie, dog? I have a I have a couple sitting behind me, but I ha- I'd have to tie them and everything, and the rest of them are out getting washed. Like, really behind on laundry. <laughs> Jason on Facebook says, hey, it's great to catch a live show. Thanks, guys. Jason, we appreciate you being with us on Facebook. We love our Facebook audience, and it's it's an, uh, it's an old yet growing audience. The, our Facebook page, we started when we started MHH, and uh, it continues to grow, especially this year. It's really just taken a huge leap forward in uh, membership. So we like to shout out and say hello to our 87-some-odd thousand followers on Facebook. And, Jason, we appreciate you listening in so eric this frees up just shy of four million bucks for the broncos getting rid of yeah. jeff hireman sending him on the, down the road which by the way i don't know if you saw this um in fact i'm just going to really quickly put a pin in what i was about to say we'll come back to it jeff hireman released a statement and i just want to read this because it's we clown on hireman but he's he, you know he's a bronco original bronco yeah. drafted by the broncos technically eric on his resume is world champion because he was yeah. he was on the roster technically, even though it was the IR for Super Bowl 50. But let me just read this statement. I want your thoughts. He says, quote, I'm grateful for all I'm extremely grateful for all of my experiences as a Denver Bronco. I owe tremendous thanks to John Elway, Coach Kubiak, and Joe Ellis for drafting me to such a special first class organization. I greatly appreciate how the entire organization has treated myself, my family, and my teammates over the past five years. Broncos country. I thank you for all of the support through the ups and downs. There isn't a better fan base in the country, and I'll always cherish our time together. Most of all, I'm thankful for the teammates I have had the pleasure of playing alongside. I learned so much from so many of them. The memories will last a lifetime and never fade. I can hold my head high as I take all this in, knowing I gave everything I had day in and day out during my time here in Denver. I wish nothing but the best to the team and the city, you will always have a fan in me, close quote, which is a very classy message. Yeah. Honestly, Eric, if I just had $4 million ripped from my grasp, I don't know that I could be that gracious. 
Yeah, I mean, it's I never heard anything negative about Jeff Hireman as a person. And even as a player, the biggest negatives was that he just struggled to stay healthy, which it, it's sometimes is what's the right word is a uh, is a little bit uh, mean to kind of harp on players for not for getting hurt and everything. Cause sometimes right. it just, it, sometimes it just happens, but uh, I mean, yeah, he just couldn't stay, stay available and the best ability is availability really in the NFL as the saying goes, but yeah, he's a class act. His statement, who was a class act of him and everything. And just, he's a guy who he's, he's shown he can be that number three reliable depth tight end, but it's just a matter. He never really showed more than that, and I think that's what it came down to. With between the money he was getting and that, like, but yeah, I hope they, I hope he catches on elsewhere. I really do. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Yeah, I do too. I mean, you want you hope the best for former Broncos. I had the article at uh, MileHighHuddle dot com, and just doing some quick research before I hit the old publish button. He had sixty three receptions. As a Bronco, yeah. a little over 600 yards, five touchdowns. I was actually surprised he had that many touchdowns. I did honestly, in my memory, I only have one that comes to me. If you say, "Do you remember that Jeff Hireman touchdown?" <laughs> I can think of one, but he had five. No offense, as Sinji points out here, has more yards and touchdowns in one season than Jeff is his entire career. Well, that's not true. We get the gist of what you're saying. Fant had 500 and some odd yards as a rookie, which is a franchise record for a rookie tight end. And three touchdowns. So not quite, but we get your your main point. Fant produced in one season as a rookie, basically what Jeff Hireman did in his entire five years in Denver. And Eric, if anything speaks to why the Broncos were dissatisfied with him, that's a really good example. The, I mean, you, you spoke to it. The injury bug, look, it's no respecter of persons. It can strike anyone at any time. There's no way to predict exactly when it's going to happen. And in that sense, it's unfair but to to completely blame a player who becomes injury prone, even though, you know, it's frustrating they're not on the field. It's in our nature as human beings to point the finger. But still, in the case of Jeff Hireman, Eric, the unfortunate reality is that it wasn't a one-time thing, right? He yeah. was injured in 2015, tears an ACL covering a kick in a rookie minicamp. He missed uh, two more games the next year couple more games the next. He missed five in uh, 2018, and then he even missed a couple games last year. I mean, this yeah. guy was good for at least two missed games per year, and I think that's one of the things that had to have frustrated the front office as well, Eric. Yeah. That combined with the fact that he just failed to kind of take that step forward as a pass catcher. Yeah, definitely. And it's just – and with this too is like – I, I want to say, though, this is about the, the comment, though, is comp- – Sorry, comparing Fant to Jeff Hireman is a little unfair because they are two very different types of tight ends. Noah Fant is that athletic pass catching tight end, so yeah, he should have the the same similar number of or a high number of catches and everything. Whereas Jeff Hireman was kind of that dual threat. I mean, or not really a dual threat. He was a safety net at yeah. tight end as a receiver, and then he was the inline blocker. So it, it's kind of a little unfair there to compare the two with what they did. But let's talk a little bit about that money that gets freed up. And Glenn here says, Chad, did you write that article about Hireman five months ago? Just punch it up today. I could have. I really could have. In our business, they call that writing a shell. You basically write the shell of a story and you put it on ice so that when the news you're expecting hits, you might update a couple small points and then you just hit publish. I could have written a shell on it. I didn't need to. But in this case, it's it's an appropriate uh, joke. But Eric, three point eight seven five million, I think, is what is freed up on the cap by yeah, moving on from, like from Hireman. What do you think the Broncos are going to do with that money? They still have, ostensibly anyway, some question marks at corner. Even though they got, you want to talk about a log jam? There's so many cornerbacks on this roster and tight ends. I don't know which one, uh, you know, tips the scales. But tight or uh, offensive tackles, another issue, off ball linebacker. I'd be lying to you if I were to tell you that I know exactly I'm up to date on all the available free agents out there, but is that even money you see them using right away? Cause I don't. Um, this is actually a kind of a tough one to answer because it, a lot of it deals with 
what's going on in the world. I mean, they've already stated that the NFL salary cap next year is going to drop. So I don't know if they'll want to spend that money right now or use it as kind of a rollover into next year so they can give them a little bit more extra cap room. I mean, I would expect them to go sign, but I, I really don't think they'll go sign anybody for a decent amount of money. I might It might be like somebody on a vet minimum deal, somebody who's willing to come on that, might be at offensive tackle, might be a cornerback, might be a quarterback. I mean, with everything going on with how important quarterback is, they just cut Riley Neal, so they could really be looking for a fourth quarterback to kind of come in and potentially be that number three quarterback just in case – Drew Locke or and or Jeff Driscoll or somebody else gets what's going on and putting Brett Rippin on the practice squad with being able to protect four players who go onto the practice squad. That could be a big change there. So it's definitely a possibility. I don't know where they'll really go. I'm not sure they'll really put that money, a lot of that money elsewhere. Yeah, I mean. They have so many bodies at corner. You just have to kind of let that competition at this stage shake out because even though there aren't a lot of obvious answers today, these, this is a a room that has a lot of potential. I mean, if they, if they have one thing in spades, it's potential. Does that cornerback room now offensive tackle, especially with Elijah Wilkinson opening up on the pup list, that's a little bit more concerning to me. But as you talked about in your article slash video a week or so back, there's Calvin Anderson, uh, there's one more I'm, I'm missing off the top. Oh, uh, Jake Rogers. There's Quinn, Quinn Bailey. Bailey. So there are some bodies there. I think this is more – this isn't a, a move made by the front office to free up money so they can go make a, a signing, someone they got their eye on. Like I can't remember who it was added me, an awesome fan. I don't know who – I'm sorry I can't remember your name. As soon as the move was made today, hey, does this mean the Broncos are going after Logan Ryan, the corner? No, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. So – I'm more inclined to agree with you, Eric, that that's a consideration they're kicking on down the road, flex that money over into 2021 and uh, see where the chips fall. James makes a curious point here, though. He says, most of all, I question the why and the when. Why now? Why cut Hireman now and not let the competition play out in the ca- in training camp, especially because he's a better blocker than Vanette, to be honest. And then his other point here is, why now that the Broncos have lost out on the likes of Jason Peters, Darquez Denard in the third, fourth wave of free agency? What do you think is the is the answer there, Eric? I think that the reason why they chose now was, as I stated earlier, is they didn't do it earlier because they were hoping there'd be a preseason game for him to boost his value and potentially trade him as they tried during the draft. So I think that that's why they didn't do it earlier. And I think why now with no preseason games is that they didn't want him to go into camp and take reps away from Albert Okue Banam Andrew Beck, once he's off the list and every the reserve list, um, Austin Fort, who they really liked last year. I mean, I don't know if many fans know this, but Austin Fort, he had a roster spot before he got hurt. They came out and stated that he had a roster spot. Then he got hurt. So it could be that they want to free up those reps for them. Uh, it could be a matter of they just wanted to kind of do right by him, I guess, and give him a good chance and time to get acclimated to a new team now at this point, instead of cutting him later at the end of it, and then having all these other issues with what's going on in the world, trying to sign elsewhere as a season starting. So it just could be a combination of those things. But I think that it, I think that's what it, it does actually come down to. We have a fan apparently of the crack hit TV show on all stream on uh, Netflix trailer park boys. We got bubbles rocking the, the <laughs> profile pic here. And I'll be honest with you, Trailer Park Boys is a show that I am kind of I, I kind of turn it on when I'm just wanting to glaze off and just kind of vibe out. It's funny. It's completely irreverent and obscene. And I love it. It's it's just 14 year old Canadian humor. I love it. But Darko also as a fellow drummer, we, we I salute you, my friend. He says this is really sweet. He says, hey, guys, thanks for all the work you do. I do not. No, if you're aware, but you make many fans happy with MHH podcasts. I don't always listen live, but I always listen. I love to put on my headphones, study my drums, listening to you. It's my favorite time of the night. And it's really cool. This is something Zach and I talk about quite often, Eric, when we hear things like this. Um, The way that people kind of work these podcasts into their daily lives and schedules. I know for me as a big time podcast listener myself, 
I typically listen to a lot of podcasts when I'm in my car, also when I'm in my yard, if I'm in the kitchen, and if I'm at the gym, which hasn't been much lately since the old CV hit, the word that shall go unmentioned. But nevertheless, it's just cool to hear. I mean, it's flattering, of course, obviously, we like hearing it. But uh, it's really cool to hear what this podcast means to people and how they work it into their lives. It is. And that's one of the very humbling things for me, at least doing this, is how people will not necessarily make a change, but work me talking into their lives or any of us talking really is just it's very humbling. And at, at times it like it kind of it wears me out at times that there are people out there that actually want to listen to me talk when half the time my own family doesn't want to listen to me. talk. <laughs> yeah. Tell my kids they're they're like, dad's talking tune out. <laughs> Chris Hernandez jumping in one of our super chat superstars, longtime listener of these podcasts and a big time member of the MHH community. He says, cheers, MHH fam. Hashtag click those little thumbs up. Appreciate that, Chris. You know, we love you, buddy. And uh, that's a good reminder, gang. Make sure you like this video. You guys have no idea how much it helps us. Even the haters out there that thumbs down the video on YouTube, they think they're hurting us. They actually help us. Any interaction with the video after you click play in the algorithm, YouTube views it the same, that it's important. Oh, people are interacting with this video. They're liking, they're commenting, they're thumbs downing. This must be important. We'll elevate it in the algorithm. So we appreciate the thumbs up, of course. We prefer it. And the channel maintains a 99-plus percent thumbs-up ratio. But I just get a kick out of that obligatory one or two guys, the trolls out there, they go, "Mm, I'm going to thumbs down this and have my (laughs) revenge because they didn't answer my question or or disagreed with me on Twitter all those months ago about (laughs) Joe Flacco or or Trevor Simeon or something. Look, you – can think you're getting your revenge, but Eric, it actually helps MHH. The hate just yeah. fuels us, dog. Yeah, it does, and that's something that I learned a long time ago. Uh, Ten years ago or so, I tried uh, getting into gaming, being a professional gamer. I was playing competitive thing. I started a YouTube channel, and I learned that way back then. And like up until recently, I actually had the videos still up, and I went back and watched them and realized how terrible I was. But yeah, I mean, any interaction with a YouTube video does actually helps the video and the the channel that it's on. Um, I want to, before we shift gears, I want to talk about this unique stat that uh, you originally wanted to kind of center our conversation around tonight. And yes, NorCal 91, the green bastard, indeed. Um, Talking about bubbles, excuse me, frog in my throat. But before we do, I've got a question for you. I did some research. I talked about this this week, earlier this week on the Huddle Up podcast. It's been a while ago, but I decided to go back and look at the two years uh, in New York. Pat Shermer made the decisions on how many tight ends were kept. One year it was three. One year it was four. With the log jam they have, the way I see it, you're going to keep the, the locks for the roster are Noah Fant, Albert O, and Nick Vanette. So there's three for sure making it, <clears throat> and that makes sense. Do you think there will be four? And if there is four, who's that fourth guy? And I understand before you answer this, the new practice squad rules, you know, you got 16 guys now you can carry on the squad. Plus there's some veteran workarounds where, you know, uh, accrued seasons are, they're a little bit more liberal with regard to being able to earmark a few of those spots anyway, for actual veterans, not just guys in their first two or three years in the league. So you could you know, in theory, leverage that new tool to keep a Jake Butt, a uh, Troy Fumagalli, an Austin Fort on ice on the practice squad, call them up on Sundays because you can get to 55 for, yeah. for the day and then send them back down the next day. Yeah, I think ultimately they end up keeping three. And I think that the whole practice squad changes is a big reason for that. And I could see actually three tight ends landing on the practice squad to help maximize that. Andrew Beck being one of them, just in case they, they're going into a game where they want to utilize a fullback or another game where maybe no offense a little bit banged up. Maybe they want more of a, a receiver kind of guy. They can go with Jake Butt, who is a little bit more of a receiver than a blocker. Or if they go into it and um, and uh, Nick Van Ness a little bit banged up, maybe they want to go with the more inline tight end. And that could be Austin Fort. So I think that that will be that. And if anybody gets seriously hurt, you can just call them up. 
but I think it'll be three on the three on the active roster and then possibly and I really do think three on the practice squad. I really do. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Uh Talon wants to know. Hey guys, did y'all see the Drew Locke video? I assume you're talking about his presser today, the Zoom press conference, which we yeah, we we've seen that. Honestly, Eric, today, my fellows in the – our fellows, I should say, in the media, I was quite disappointed with their line of questioning today. I don't know how many times you can ask and thus how many different ways Drew Locke can answer a question that is something to the effect of, do you feel like this time around you can let your hair down and really just be yourself? <laughs> Compared to last year when you got here, you couldn't really be yourself because of Flacco – there were literally three different questions about that. It's a topic he has spoken to at different times. Yeah. Guys, we're sitting here on the doorstep of the season. We got a new system. We got new players. And you're talking about fitting in and being yourself. Dude, let's talk about issues that actually matter that we don't know the answers to. We already know the answers to those questions. He's already addressed those questions. I was a little bit disappointed. But nevertheless, the one thing I took away from his presser today, Eric, very encouraging. I can't remember who it was that asked the question. Um, either way, it was something to the effect of, hey, look, no one could have foreseen there being no off season. You know, you've got a pretty dang good excuse to kind of have an out if things don't go well. Have you tempered your expectations for 2020 in light of what occurred and the fact that yeah. there's no preseason and all that? Drew Locke wasn't hearing that at all. And I'm not going to necessarily read the quotes to you guys, but – the, to paraphrase him, he basically said, look, no excuses. We all get 24 hours in a day, Eric. The, yeah. the virus affected all 32 teams. That was a, an equal and level playing field, and I'm not taking any easy ways out. I think we can still achieve the goals I set out for 2020, irregardless of the pandemic. Yeah, and definitely, and that's a good way to answer the question, really, because – yeah, every single team has to deal with this. Now, is every team hiring, having a new offensive coordinator, a new offensive scheme? No, but they have new moving pieces always. Every team does that they have to sit there and figure out. I mean, with the Kansas City Chiefs, Damian Williams opted out. And now they have to get Clyde Edwards Hilaire, a rookie, him acclimated to the offense with the impact that offseason. So even the Super Bowl champions are dealing with this kind of issue. So there really isn't any excuse for it. Now, I do think that the Broncos offense will be a bit of a slow start just because of it. I mean, they have a lot of very young and just a lot of new pieces on it on that offensive line with Graham Glasgow, uh, possibly a, well, a new starting center, period. Doesn't matter who ends the job there. Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, all these new pieces coming in. I think it'll be a slow start to it, but it's, yeah, there's no excuse for it. I mean, they got to go out there, they got to get the job done, they got to go to work, and they know that. Glenn brings up another issue, <clears throat> topic, I should say, that uh, Drew Locke addressed today. He says, <clears throat> this is Glenn. Sorry, I don't know. I got this frog in my throat. He says, when, we, when Drew talked about his dad being affected, it really showed what a family guy he is. We did find out that Albert O is living in his old apartment, which is true. Drew just moved himself into a new home, an actual house, and the lease on his apartment. Albert O has been staying in that apartment solo. They probably shared a time there together a little bit, but now he's just – Basically, uh, what's the word? Uh, oh, come on, dude. Squatting, <laughs> squatting, and there it is. He's squatting in Drew Locke's pad, and Locke expects him to kind of take over the lease because it ends today. It's the last day. Um, but, yeah, to the point, though, Glenn, of his dad being affected, for those of you who don't know this, Drew Locke's father, Andy Locke, and his mom own multiple restaurants in and around Lee Summit, Missouri, the greater Kansas City area. And so, obviously, the word that shall go unmentioned, the bug will say, it devastated. <clears throat> if you're in the hospitality side of this economy, whether that's restaurants, you know, coffee houses, hotels, bed and breakfast, those, if you're in that realm where you're dependent on foot traffic, you're dependent on uh, people actually coming in, to, being able to come into your store or your place of business, people traveling, tourism, things like that. You were inordinately crushed by this thing economically. And I can only hope that his folks who definitely have had to 
figure out how to adapt and survive in this new environment or hopefully temporary environment. Hopefully they got some of that PPE money and they were able to float some of their bills short term and help them get through it. I know a lot of people in the, in the business realm that did take those loans from the government that are actually just, they're not even loans. If you don't lay people off, they don't have to pay that money back. I don't know if the locks did anything like that, but it does humanize the fact that Eric this isn't something we like to talk much about on this podcast, politics, because it's unfortunate that a health uh, issue or crisis has now po- has political implications. But nevertheless, no. it's just a good reminder that there are more costs in this equation than than loss of life due to the thing that Shogo and mentioned, meaning that economic costs. I mean, these guys, this family, the Locke family, and many of you right now are nodding along because you, either yourselves or someone you know have gone through a similar thing with this. They've put their life blood into these businesses, countless hours of sacrifice, countless dollars they've invested, people's livelihoods. It does affect life. I mean, li- li- you know, live or die, life, it does affect things. And so my heart goes out to them, and I hope that they continue to roll with the punches and, and survive this thing. Yeah, definitely. And uh, that's one of the things that it really doesn't ever get talked about is this what's going on. It's affecting people in so many different ways. And I think everybody can agree that's watching this, that we all wish that it just wasn't going on. We wish that it didn't happen and everything like that. But uh, it is. And we're just trying to kind of uh, figure our way through it. Yep. Just pray for the uh, V word sooner than later. That's all that's right now. That's our best bet for a return to normalcy is pray for the V word. All right. We got Andy. I want to get to your Drew Lock stat. We're going to get to that. Uh, we're at 35 minutes. We got a little time. Andy on Facebook says, Hey guys, I usually save two or three vacation days to drive from liberal Kansas to go to Denver to be liberal, uh, to be a part of the many Broncos fans in training camp. I'm sad not being able to go this year. So my question is, do you guys go to training camp? If so, what do you miss about not being able to? Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's not really something I miss. Uh, I'm missing out on in terms of, you know, it's just, it's work. It's fun to watch because football is, football is absolutely interesting. And, you know, we th- th- there's a reason why we do this. We're obsessed with football. That's how both Eric and I got into this. Neither one of us, got into media because we went to college to become a sports journalist. We got into this through our passion for the game, through our interest in the game, through our creativity, and just through kind of a burning desire to let people know what we think about the Denver Broncos. And and that's just kind of how MHH, how we came together and, and Eric and I teamed up all those years ago, going back now, what's this going to be? So this is the seventh year together on, as MHH. And then before that, we did a year together as well, maybe a little even more than that. So Eric and I have been on this, this uh, MHH ship for a long time. And the fan aspect is still real. Eric, I don't know about you, but way back in the day, man, I would, I mean, even in the early, well, I would say that the last time I can remember having this feeling was the Tebow year. Cause it was shortly mm-hmm. after that, that I started getting into the media aspect, writing, talking about it, but I would, in the clutch moments, man, I could feel my adrenaline. Like I'm hanging by a thread on what happens here on this kick or whatever. And if it didn't go my way, if it didn't go the way of my team, my day is ruined. My week is ruined. (laughs) And those stakes for me, as much as I want to see the Broncos win, of course I want to see the Broncos do well. Those stakes have long just fizzled and gone because my focus is no longer. I just hope they win. I want to understand why they lost. If they lost, why they won, if they won, where they go from here, analyzing it rather than dwelling on, you know, just the ups and downs of, of the results. Yeah. I'm, I'm similar to somewhat the same way. I mean, I still get that. Oh, oh, come on, make it like on a game winning field goal. Like the fan of me comes out then. And like that Chicago bears game yeah. last year with that field goal. I remember how pissed I was afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Like I still get that a little bit, but in a lot of games, especially towards the end of the season, I'm just, I get a little bit worn out at by the end of the season, but I yeah. still love every minute of it. Like just doing this, like just the the audience that we have, the the fans, everything. Like it's so awesome and everything, and that adds a whole new element to just doing this and being a Broncos fan at the same time. Is that's just something that it makes up for 
that kind of that little bit of that loss of the fanship of mine, it brings something new to it. Absolutely. We got a question here from Kenneth. He says, who is the most sacks this year? Not named Miller or Chubb. Eric, for me, it's Darrell Casey. I bet dollars to donuts. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up with more sacks than one of those guys, but I still think Miller's going to get back to double digits this year. I've been, I wouldn't say negative about Vaughn. I'd be, I would say I've been critical in terms of, yeah. look, let's not make excuses for a future Hall of Famer. He knows he has to do better than he did last year. Those game changing plays and key moments, especially, just didn't come when they needed to. But I'm not willing to chalk it up purely to father time and say, well, you know, he's just over the hill. It's just the way it's going to go from now on. I think he's going to turn the ship around. And Vic Fangio spoke to this earlier this week on Tuesday in his presser that he sees a hunger in Vaughn this year that he doesn't feel like he's seen in recent times. And, you know, Zach and I laugh about how how much Fangio likes to he'll compliment Vaughn on, in the first half of the sentence and then insult him basically in the second <laughs> half. Cause what are you implying? If you're saying he's more motivated now than he hasn't been the last few years, you're saying it wasn't motivated enough, right? You're saying he was lacking something or whatever. And, you know, put on a spot, Fangio is probably going to argue that point. Said, That's not what I'm saying at all. He just has a little extra, but nevertheless, I think Vaughn's cruising for just a big time season and Chubb, I do see him bouncing back and having a good year. It's just we don't know how much of a pitch count the Broncos are going to have him on to open this season. So it wouldn't surprise me to see Jarrell Casey get sack numbers that are close to whatever Chubb finishes with. Yeah, I think – I mean, I've been pretty critical on Miller as well. I mean, last year, everybody wanted to give him excuses for learning the new scheme, but when I went back and watched him, like – he just wasn't as fast off the snap. Like, and that was very noticeable. And we started to see a little bit of that in 2018. So part of me does think it's age. I do think it's a little bit, but I mean, he's put in the work. I saw the the one video he put out and he does seem to have a hunger in him. So I could see him having a good bounce back here. And I think that as long as he is able to, unless as long as the season's a full season, I think Bradley Chubb will push for comeback player of the year. I, I expect a great year out of him. I expect him to be the um, sack leader for the Broncos, actually. But the guy who I think comes in comes in third for that after those two, I think it's going to be Draymond Jones. Ooh. I think with what he did last year, like I'm super excited for it. He was the best defensive lineman last year who had 150 pass rushes. He was the most efficient. He was the um, had like the second most pressures, I think. And just was way up there with it. He got some good quality sacks as well, not just coverage sacks like Shelby Harris did. So I'm really excited for it. I think they we're going to have a big year. I know last week I, one of my bold predictions was that he should be starting over Shelby Harris. And I still think that. I think he should. I'm expecting big things from him. And Drell Casey, I think – I mean, that's not a bad way to go either. Drell Casey, he's just so good of a pass rusher on the defensive line that he could easily be that number three guy. All right, we got Bryce jumping in with a question. Can Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton be better than Emmanuel Sanders and Demarius Thomas? I definitely think they have the the potential to do that because I think Jerry Judy, fresh out of the box, you know, you unwrap the box, here's the you know brand new player. I think he steps onto the field day one in the NFL as a much more advanced and talented player than Sanders ever was. Thus, his ceiling is higher. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Sanders was some kind of schlub. I just think Jerry Judy is like one of the next great wide receivers. And Sanders was a guy that took three, four years to marinate in the NFL before he really be- – and it really took Peyton Manning to bring it out of him. So credit to Peyton Manning for Sanders becoming a two-time Pro Bowler and multi-thousand-yard receiver, even though he did it once with Simeon. Credit to him for doing that. And Thomas, both that year, went over 1,000 with Trevor Simeon in 2016. But nevertheless, what's your answer? Can Jerry, Judy, and Sutton be better than Sanders Thomas? I think they can be really close. I think that I definitely think that Cortland Sutton can end up a better receiver than Demarius Thomas. I think his ability to stay on the field is a little bit higher. I know a few weeks ago, actually, Lance and I actually discussed that whole aspect to it. Can Sutton be a better rec- end up being a better receiver than Demarius Thomas? And we both we both agreed that yeah, we definitely think he could. I mean, the numbers up to now are better than or similar to what uh, Demarius Thomas did. As long as Sutton has his hands working at the way they were last year, then, oh, yeah, it's very easy for him to surpass Thomas. And then the other part is I think you're actually pretty well spot on with Judy and Sanders. I think that Judy, 
I don't. I wouldn't say that he's better in step now than Sanders was, but I think he's not far behind him, and he can easily overcome that and step it and step over that. So I think both of them they have the potential to be, to be better than their counterparts individually, and to do, be a better duo as obviously a duo. Do you buy that Jerry Judy was the number one receiver on the Broncos board? I don't. You think it was Rugs? I think it was Rugs. I, I've heard I've heard a lot of stuff about that, and all of it points to that. I do think that it was Rugs. Uh, KP jumping in, showing some love on Super Chat, as he is wont to do. Anytime he's in the stream, he's showing love on Super Chat, and we appreciate you, my friend. Rocking a very rare and unique hat. It's the last <laughs> of that batch that was made up, and none will ever be made like it again. I wish it was bigger to fit that glorious dome of yours, KP. Uh this is the last one of its kind, but as you can see, it's not orange. Everyone wanted that orange hat, and I wore that orange hat a couple of times podcasting. This is the last one. I'm saving this one for a special occasion. It's a blue one. That one's orange, obviously. But KP, he says, shout out to Buana. You're killing it, bro. The stream has been super efficient since you hopped on board. Thanks for what you do. That's a very sweet sentiment, KP. You want to know the irony, though? Juan is off tonight. He's not in the stream tonight. Unless I missed him in the chat and he jumped he's, in. He's had a couple comments. but Has he? But he's yeah. not in the control room with us. He had some things no. cooking tonight. He had some things he had to handle. Um, but he'll be back tomorrow, and it'll be a gas. And nevertheless, this is a guy that is dedicated. Only one of us at MHH is actually in on every single podcast seven days a week, and it's John. It's Juan a Beast. So we tip our cap to him as well. And yep. honestly, Eric, I think John's just getting started in terms of what his role could be at MHH if he continues to, you know, do what he does. It's only uh, he's he's going to grow it and become, you know, he published his first article a few weeks back. I don't know if you caught that. Yep. And he's got some interest in continuing to write and continuing to do pod producing, continuing to do some video stuff potentially. So sky's the limit. And it's been great getting to work with him and getting to know him and kind of show him the ropes and teach him how this crazy business works. Yeah, it hasn't. I mean, it's all, it's always awesome to meet new people doing this and get to know John. Um, I remember when, uh, when he first actually started commenting on MHH, uh, I was always like, uh, he, he commented on my article. What is it? Cause, cause it, it was often like going Very against indeed. what I was saying. It's just like, yep. like, it was just like, uh, like, all right, let's go see what he says. But, uh, yeah, it's been awesome getting to know him. He's an awesome dude. And uh, John, if you're still in the chat, I hope your cat's doing better. Like, I really do. Yeah. Yeah, John's a good example of, as a fan, you can disagree with a with an author's mm-hmm. take, a podcaster's take, and do it with respect. You don't need to be like edgelord trying to dunk on anybody. You can say, look, that's a point. I get what you're saying. But did you ever look at it this way? John was really good at doing that. Uh, Brent Suhu on Facebook wants to know, I'm wondering if Albert O is really going to be the tight end too. I feel like maybe a vet is going to be more valuable. Eric, my hypothesis on the Albert O front is that you're not going to really see whatever impact is in store for him as a Bronco. I don't really think you're going to see it with maybe a few exceptions until 2021 and beyond. I think this is a year where when they are, when they do run two tight end sets, you're going to see Nick Vanette come in to be that blocking guy and occasionally a decoy that'll catch a play action, you know, a little out route or something, move the chains. I think Albert O's day is down the road. It takes time for tight ends to marinate, which is one of the reasons why I don't understand why more people aren't more impressed by what Noah Fan accomplished as a rookie. I mean, it's. For him to come out and, and catch as many balls as he did, the yard, and it wasn't just producing the yards. Eric, he had, I think, all three of those touchdowns, if I'm not mistaken, were from 60 yards or more out. No, what, two of them were. Two of them were. Excuse me. One oh, of them yeah, was, I was gonna 20 say, plus two of them were. So, anyway, that's an explosive talent, four or five speed. And yet, ironically, to Brent's point here, Albert O is actually faster, ran a, just a fraction of a second faster than Fant, a 449. To to fans five five uh, four five zero. Yeah, I, I mean I'm with you. I think that if they, I'm not expecting a lot of stuff out of Albert Okaway, but on this year, I think we might see him a little bit in the red zone just because of his size and everything. But he's just so limited as a blocker. I mean, Noah Fant's better than he was, and we ripped on Fant's blocking last year. I know I did a lot, and yeah. he just and Albert Okaway, is a a niche player right now. He can be that seam stretcher, and that's about it because he can't turn. 
Like it's like you have more success trying to turn a ship than you do than Albert Okway Benam has turning. So I mean that's something that they got to figure out a way to work around a little bit. I'm not sure exactly how because a lot of that's due to his size. He's so tall and I mean he carries his weight well, but he's like 260, 65 pounds. Like at that as his height, it's not easy to turn like on a dime or anything like that. He's got he's got to roll his his corners a little bit. So. We'll see what happens there. I think that this year is definitely more of a development thing with filling a niche role in the meantime. Aaron Lynch, by the way, it's good to see you, my friend. Hope everything's going okay up in – he's been in Alaska. I don't know if you knew this, Eric, but he has been uh, doing some deep-sea fishing commercially in uh, the waters off the coast of Alaska. So it's good to have you in the chat, my friend. We also have Lance Sanderson, the – co-host of Dove Valley Deep Divers, Eric's partner here Friday nights, and new dad to Caven. He says, what's up, fellas? Just checking in to let everybody know we're all home, that mama and baby are happy and healthy. Y'all stay safe, take care, have a great weekend. Thanks for checking in, my friend, and we're glad to hear everyone's doing well. Yeah. Let's see. Eric, we're at 50 minutes, so let's talk about that stat you wanted to get to, and then we'll just kind of see what the rest of the – the stream has to say, but you wanted to address a specific statistic that, you know, it's a little bit concerning from Drew Locke's rookie five game sample size. Drop some knowledge on us. So there's a, one of the big things that people look at is the yards per attempt and Drew Locke's was 6.5. And that's just a, that's a little like quite a bit lower than the average of what it is. And it just comes down to is, was it him being conservative or was the play calling? And now I have a series coming up and I, I wanted to talk about this a little bit because actually Nick brought it to my attention about it on Twitter and I responded back to it. And uh, yeah, I'm doing a series on Drew Log. So I went back and I watched every single passing play that he had from his five games and everything. And he, ha- he did have a low yards per attempt and he often found himself going for the underneath throws and everything. But a lot of that was by design, I noticed. It was a lot of one- and three-step drops, just getting the ball out quickly. Um, I can't remember which game it was. I think it was Detroit. Like, most of them was, like, almost every single play, really, was just a one- or three-step drop. Like, just get it out quickly and everything. And part of that could have been to help out the offensive line a little bit. But I think that a lot of it had to do with just Drew Locke being a rookie and just wanting Tim to just kind of get things down, keep confidence in him, and just let him just kind of do things and then trust in the playmakers. So I'm actually kind of curious to see how that's going to translate into this year and Pat Shermer's scheme with better playmakers than they had last year and more developed playmakers with Noah Fant and Quentin Sutton hopefully taking another step forward and Drew Locke having experience. I think it's something that of all the things to watch for this year, I'm this is one statistical aspect I'm very anxious to keep an eye on is what is Drew Locke's yards per attempt. Well said, and I think this was something also Brett Coleman, who does YouTube breakdowns, really good job as a film guy. I, I noticed he said something to this effect today on Twitter that did his deal on Drew Locke. I'm sure a video is forthcoming. Might already be out. I don't know. But he said basically the he liked what he saw, but the one thing he wants to see better from Drew in year two is more of a grip it and rip it mentality where, you know, just don't take the don't take the low-hanging fruit so much and try and push the ball a little bit. But, Eric, I think a lot of that just had to do with, first and foremost, you had a first-time play caller, first time in the NFL calling plays, telling him, pump the brakes, take what the defense gives you, steady as she goes, you know, and also a conservative defensive-minded head coach. Now, I say that in a general sense because Fangio did show a penchant for aggression as an overall game manager at times. You can think back, for example, to week 13 on that final possession Scangarello calls down a kneel. Let's just take this thing to OT. Fangio jumps in between and says, no, 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 take a shot. Let's see what happens. They take a shot, lock deep to Sutton. They get the PI, roll McManus onto the field, kick the field goal, win the game. In that sense, I think Locke was being coached, even though the stakes were gone. I mean, the Broncos knew that when they started 0-4, uh, excuse me, their odds of making the playoffs were nil, and – I don't think they got officially eliminated till the week before, if I'm not mistaken. I think week 16 was when they officially got eliminated from playoff yeah, contention. So. But nevertheless, the, he's being told to keep the cards close to the vest. And so in that sense, I can't, I can't read too much into that stat. And I'm going to, I'm going to, this is one of those cases where I'm going to point to the sample size and say, look, it was only five games. 
let's, you know, let's, the jury's out. Let's see what he can do with a little bit more time at the wheel, so to speak. Uh, really quick, Eric, we got Terry Randall, who jumped back in on Super Chat. Appreciate you, my brother. Still think that Judy Sutton and Fant are going to push 3,500 yards. Hey, man, Eric, if if Drew Locke's the truth, then that's what will happen. Yeah. If Drew Locke takes that step forward that we're all hoping he will, that's that's very likely. Yeah, and I just wanted to uh, just make this clear. Is I fully think that it was Rick Scangarello and the play calling that is why we saw such a low yards per attempt because – one of the reasons they fired him and they came out and said this was because he wasn't aggressive enough and they weren't using Locke the way that they had hoped he would. So I definitely think that that is what it was more so. And I mean, basically is we'll get that answer this year. What's his yard his yards per attempt? Well, if it's higher, then we know for sure that it was Rick Scangarello. If it's lower, then it is a little bit of conservative play from him. So that's it's one reason why I'm willing to keep an eye, wanting to keep an eye on it. Andy wants to know, do you get starstruck when you meet a player? You enjoy watching on the current roster. I'd like to meet Vaughn. Thank you, Andy. And to the audience, one of these days, I'll tell you my John Elway story. My <laughs> the, the one time I met John Elway, it's actually a really good story. It's not one I like to share and talk about too much publicly, but it happened very early on in my media career. And so I was very green behind the ears, and I'll tell that story someday, but not today. I'll, uh, I'll have to tease you in that sense. Eric, we got time for one or two more questions. Gang, if we don't get to you tonight, apologies. We'll, we'll try and get to you tomorrow, tomorrow night, whoever's on tomorrow night. Uh, Miller707 wants to know, if A.J. Bouye has a good season and Michael Ojemudia looks good and Bryce Callahan stays healthy and performs well, is cornerback still a need in next year's draft? I really want Denver to get Sean Wade. Eric, I'll let you jump on this. Oh, um, my take is yes, because you still have the, so 30, 30 is about the age of the drop off for cornerbacks and AJ boy, if I'm not mistaken, is either 30 right now or just turned 31 or I can't remember his age exactly, but I know he's near 30, either over it or just under it. Um, and he's been dealing with injuries and he's been declining since his, I think it was an outstanding 2017 season. Then you have Bryce Callahan, who, if he does stay healthy and play every single game this year, that's a first. And then Michael Ojemudia, him stepping up, that would be awesome. I think that's that's one thing where you kind of concerned about a sophomore drop off, that sophomore uh, slump that you kind of see every now and then with players. But it's more so with AJ Boye and his age and Bryce Callahan and his health. Even if he stays healthy, it's still something to worry about and be concerned with. And Sean Wade, I absolutely love him. I mean, he was my number two corner for this year before this last draft, before he decided to return right behind his teammate. Um, I think he's great. I think he has the ability to play inside, outside, play multiple different coverage schemes. Big fan of his. I'm really excited to see what he's able to do this year. If they end up playing games, I'm not sure what's going on with Ohio State. I can't remember seeing anything or uh, their conference or anything. But, I mean, yeah, I still think that cornerback would be a big need for it. And if not him, there's a, there's definitely other cornerbacks. This is a really good cornerback class. Perennial Pro Bowl offensive tackle of the Philadelphia Eagles, Jason Peters, has a question here. Eric, on Facebook, our great listener, Jason Peters, JP. We'll call you JP. How's that? Do you think they'll cut Jake Butt next? Uh, do you think they'll cut Jake Butt next since they released Hireman? Eric, I happen to think there's a there's a really good reason why the Broncos haven't already just ripped the Band-Aid off and moved on from Jake Butt. They're long-suffering, their patience, nursing him through setback after setback. And it's because John Elway's a big believer in this cat. John Elway, he's also stubborn, you know? It wasn't until very recently that John Elway showed any kind of penchant for moving on from a draft pick that was round one through five until their rookie deal expired. I mean, that didn't happen until, uh, what was it? Was it the, I'm trying to remember now, was it the 2018? No, it was, yeah, it was 2018. When they when he cut Paxton Lynch, when he cut a couple of third rounders, uh, Carlos Henderson, he cut um, Isaiah McKenzie that year, he cut Chad Kelly. But before that, Elway really was a guy that just nursed along the rookies, even if they didn't live up to pedigree, and then made a decision after their rookie deals expired. And in the case of Jake Butt, though, that long suffering and that patience, there's a reason why they haven't moved on from him, and it's because they're hoping against hope that he can actually 
stay healthy this time. And if not, you know, they gave it an honest effort. They did everything within their power as a team to nurse him through those, those knees. But I do think Jake Budd is going to be more of a factor. This is something Zach and I disagree on one of the few topics on our podcast. I think Jake Butt, Eric, is going to be more of a factor this summer than people realize. And the problem, though, if you're the Denver Broncos, is let's just say Jake Butt knocks it out of the park in training camp and plays really well in 11-on-11, 11 11, plays does well in the classroom, does well in his individual drills and 7-on-7, seven seven, and just looks so good. How can you trust it without live reps against outside yeah. competition with no preseason? That's the problem. That is definitely is, and I I, have, I want to say something real quick before I come back to that. Is CC? Thank you for point, pointing that out. He mentioned it. The AJ boy is currently twenty eight, and he'll be turning twenty nine in August. So I was a giving him a year older than I actually than he actually is. But I do I do expect things from Jake Butt this year. Um, I think that they've held on to him for a reason. I think that they were wanted him to get fully healthy, which he is now. And see what he can do. And I think that one of the reasons why they cut Jeff Harmon, as I said earlier, is to help open up reps for these other tight ends. I don't think he'll make the roster, but I i mean, he may push for it. I think a practice squad spot is more likely letting him see what he can do. And then hopefully that he's able with, hopefully he's able to stay healthy, continue to develop and then sit there and go into 20 or the 2021 season with cutting Nick Fanette and freeing up more money and using Jake Butt in that role if he's able to develop as a blocker. All right, two more, and then we got to get out of here. KP jumping in, he says, thank you for the super chat, KP. He says, uh, we're talking about a rookie tight end, smashing records with Flacco, Allen, and Locke, talking about Fant, with the worst play caller. Hopefully Shermer uses Fant's potential. I think he will, Eric. I really do. I think too much has been made of the idea that Shermer doesn't use a lot of tight ends in his formations. What people continue to miss is the fact that he uses that one tight end that's on the field a lot. And what a lot of people too is that I come to, because I say that a lot about how he doesn't use a lot of tight ends in his multiple tight ends. And a lot of people come back, come at me about this and everything. And what they feel to realize is that he uses Evan Ingram as a used Evan Ingram as a huge part of his offense. And guess what? Evan Ingram, he wasn't an inline tight end. He was more of that Y slot tight end that you moved out, the athletic guy, the receiver, you know, exactly what Fant is, except Fant is a little bit of a better blocker. So he's knows how to utilize that skill set. He knows what to do. He knows how to get the plays to really make them effective. And Fant's just got to stay, stay healthy and stay out there. And I think, I do think he has a big year. Um, I don't know what David's talking about. Thank you for the super chat, one of our superstars. And it just brings a tear to my eye seeing that profile pic with the hat, the football priest hat, the MHH face mask. I mean, you are just a boss, David. Why did they cut Natani Muti? I thought they liked him. They didn't. I just checked the wire to make sure I didn't, I'm not missing something or it didn't yeah. happen while we were live. But they did put him on the NFI list to start off camp, the non-football yeah. injury list. And all that means is – it's like the version of when they're pre, when a player hits the roster pre-injured as a rookie. It from a from a contract perspective and hedging against the worst case scenario, they put him on the NFI list. But it doesn't mean Eric that he can't progress through whatever he's still dealing with and perhaps make the roster this year. But I'm not really expecting Muti to be a factor at all this year because of that health. I think Muti's another guy that you're not really going to know much about until next summer. Yeah, I think uh, what we're looking at for him is this basically being a uh, red shirt year for him. Depending on his health, I think he can make the roster as a depth player, but that's about it. He's not He's not going to come in. He's not going to compete with Dalton Reisner for the starting left guard spot. He's not going to come in and compete with Graham Glasgow for the starting right guard spot. He's not a guy you can play at tackle. I know a lot of people want to tout this, but fun fact about Nathaniel Moody is that his arm length, if you translate translate that to a tackle, it's in the zero percentile. He has no length whatsoever. I mean, teams have issues with under 34-inch arms. I think Denver's seems to be about 33, and I think his were like 31. And those inches, they do make a little bit of a difference. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that he's going to play tackle. I think that maybe center, but they draft Lloyd Cushenberry for that. They're looking at him for guard, and it might be for guard in a couple of years from now actually, when they're able to move on from Graham Glasgow. So we'll see what happens. I mean, but the biggest thing is he's got to stay healthy, too. We're talking about that with Jeff Hireman, with Jake Butt. Nathaniel Moody played in, like, what, 
less than 20 games. I can't remember the exact number in college yeah. in four years of college. Like that, that's a lot of missed time, but it's important to remember he's still on the roster, David. So yeah. don't worry about it. the NFI list just is a specific injury designation. And it doesn't even mean that he won't, won't or can't make the 53 this year, but for now they're, they're taking it easy. All right, guys, that's got to do it for today's episode of Dove Valley deep divers. Thank you for spending some time with us here tonight. We appreciate each and every one of you being in the stream, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitch, if you're on Periscope. Thanks for joining the conversation. We give a mile-high salute to the Super Chat superstars at the end of each and every podcast, and we will, of course, be tagging you on social media on Twitter after this episode ends. Here's where we go from here, gang. First and foremost, make sure you're following Eric on Twitter, at Eric Trickle. That's E R I C K. T-R-I-C-K-E-L. If you remember just the C-Ks, you'll never go wrong when it comes to Eric <laughs> and finding him on social media. You can find me at Chad and Jensen. Uh, tomorrow night, I'm not quite sure who is going to be hosting the Saturday night podcast. Of course, traditionally, that's going to be Mile High Insiders, Luke and Nick. But both guys have things going on. We're going to have some special fill-ins. I know I'm going to be one of them. But we're going to surprise you with who the number two guy is on tomorrow night's podcast. So stay tuned for that and make sure you join us at 6 Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. And Eric, give my best to your young family, your cute little family there and your new kitty cat. And have a great weekend, brother. Yeah, you have a good weekend, too. Thank you all for showing up. And we will see you next. I'll see you next week anyways. All right, everybody. Thanks again. Don't forget to hit up huddleuppod.com. Get your swag on. Get a hat. Get a T-shirt, get a mug, get a face mask. It all helps out. And, Duke, it's good to see you, buddy. Better late than never, my friend. Better late than never. All right, gang, we got to get out of here. For Eric Trickle, I'm Chad Jensen. This is Dove Valley Deep Diver signing off. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.